Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest seminar of our Greater Toronto Legal History Seminar Series. Thank you all for coming. Professor Steve Gallagher uh, is also, of course, the co-organizer of our uh, Greater Toronto Legal History Seminar Series. And it's a great pleasure uh, to have him here and to talk today about the Chinese shipwrecks, treasure hunters, and the history of underwater culture and heritage regimes. But uh, thank you very much for everyone coming along today. This particular topic um, is, uh, is one I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, and I think many of us share an interest in underwater heritage um, today uh, because of our memories of, well, the concept of treasure hunting in the past. So many of us, if you're as old as me, I know not many people are as old as me, but if you're as old as me, you will remember things like uh, great books and great films involving treasure. So I think of, you know, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, great film, great books. And of course, uh, Treasure Island, where uh, we have Rock Newton hanging it up as uh, Long John Silver and all this idea of pirate treasure and pirate gold. Um, probably, if you're a little bit younger, if you think about treasure and you're thinking about sort of films, you're probably more likely to think about this sort of pirate. Uh, and uh, of course, you see Johnny Depp really pirating uh, a Rolling Stones guitarist, I think, in some ways. But if you are looking for lots of coverage of pirates today, I'm probably going to disappoint you, I'm afraid, because, of course, most treasure um, that is found today isn't pirate treasure. Uh, pirates tended to, when they got treasure, I think, spend it uh, on whatever pirates like to spend money on. Um, there have been a couple of uh, hordes of treasure that have been found that may be pirate treasure or are perhaps... Um, when they're being commercially sold off are sort of uh, booked as being pirate treasure, but that's all part of the, the story behind them. If you are interested in pirates, please remember, September the 19th is International Speak Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> so please put that in your diary and remember that for the future. I'm not going to speak like a pirate today. Um, if we're thinking about wrecks, if we're thinking about underwater cultural heritage, then any story to do with wreck uh, and links to treasure, of course, uh, and, and links to other forms of heritage, um, they get wide coverage around the world. So at the end of last year, we had a number of stories that made the newspapers. So just to sort of set the scene, uh, in September, there was the announcement that um, archaeologists uh, in the States believed that they'd found the wreck of, uh, of the, um, the ship Endeavour. Uh, of course, the, the ship that Captain Cook was meant to have found uh, Australia, so first visited uh, Australia in, uh, back in the 1770s. Um, and uh, the American archaeologists had been looking in the Newport Harbour in Rhode Island because the history of the, well, as much as it's dark and ever, was that the, the afterwards, after it had been used to go to Australia, it became a, a vessel that was uh, eventually used by the British in the American War of Independence uh, and was deliberately sunk by the British uh, in the harbour in Rhode Island uh, to try and block the French from actually getting in. Um, the actual uh, investigation into whether they'd found the wreck involved 25 years of, of archaeological investigations, but uh, it, it's raised a number of issues again because when this was uh, announced last year, uh, immediately um, the state government of Rhode Island claimed ownership of the wreck. And of course, there now becomes the issues of the Australians are very keen on, you know, this is a, a very important wreck for Australia. And of course, it was a British ship as well, a British warship as well. So there are issues to do with uh, any wreck really when it's found. And we'll deal with some of those later. Of course, in October, we had the announcement that the world's oldest shipwreck had been discovered in the Black Sea. Uh, this is meant to be a, uh, a probably a Greek uh, a vessel dating back to well, 2,400 years, uh, remarkably well preserved. Um, it's found at uh, quite a depth, about two kilometres down, and because of the lack of oxygen at that depth, um, the, the wooden vessel has been remarkably well preserved, it seems. Um, it you know, had made the headlines. Particularly archaeologists were very, uh, were, were very excited because this was the type of vessel that had only really been seen before, well, was known from descriptions uh, in uh, literature, and of course from illustrations on, on artworks. So this is the, the very famous siren vase in the British Museum where we see an illustration of a similar ship. Um, apart from that, um, we had uh, a vessel linked to Hong Kong, the announcement in, in October that the Benares had been uh, linked, uh, identified 
off the coast of Japan. This particular vessel had left Hong Kong on its way to San Francisco, but had sunk in a storm back in 1872. And uh, again, shows you the importance of these wrecks. Uh, yes, there are interesting things that were found on them, but they illustrate as well what the history of trade between different regions and um, importance to Hong Kong. If you are thinking of treasure, I think the, the announcement last year that most excited people on the idea of treasure was the announcement that the wreck of the San Jose had been found. This is one of these very famous um, Spanish treasure ships. This was meant to be the flagship of a Spanish treasure fleet. Um, it had sunk in the Atlantic uh, at a, um, a large depth. And um, the Colombian Navy had been searching with a team from uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in America using very advanced technology, using um, a robotic uh, um, submarine, uh, so artificial intelligence being used as well to search for this particular wreck. Um, they think they found it, they found these, these cannon, uh, and because of the particular um, insignia on the cannon, they believe this is the wreck of the Holy Grail. Um, people got very excited about this because, of course, it's meant to have been carrying a huge cargo of gold, silver, and emeralds, probably worth about 17 billion US dollars in today's money. Uh, and of course, that caused a great deal of excitement. Um, other pictures were given as well of some of the things that have been uh, found in this wreck. Um, the issues that, of course, arise from this particular wreck is a, a photograph of what happened. The wreck uh, was um, the ship was sunk. Uh, possibly because its gunpowder magazine was struck uh, in the battle with the British back in uh, the early part of the 18th century. And um, when it sank, uh, it was meant to be carrying this cargo. Um, most people don't really focus on the other side, of course, that the importance of this wreck is that there were 600 people who went down with this wreck as well. So one of the issues will be about exploiting this particular wreck site, about at this length of time since the, uh, the sinking of the wreck, well, whether there will be any human remains there as well. Other issues, um, the emeralds, the gold came from Peru. Um, it was the, uh, um, the Colombian Navy that actually sought uh, for this wreck. They're claiming ownership of it, but it was a Spanish ship as well. And of course, the Peruvians are actually saying, well, actually the gold and the, uh, the emeralds were actually taken from us. So there are other issues to do with this. The, uh, the American uh, Woodsolve Institute are not claiming anything. They don't want any interest in this uh, at all. They just did it for the, uh, um, the uh, academic side of everything. Um, treasure hunting then is really big business. Um, it's big business because there is the chance of finding treasure and treasure takes many forms. It can be gold, it can be jewels, it can be silver bullion and silver coins. But of course today, um, other forms of uh, cargo that were carried by the ships and the ships themselves are big business because of the value of, of heritage as a business as well. But apart from that, there are other novel ways that people have tried to use wrecks to raise money. And a story that was covered at the end of last year, I think probably links more into modern issues in law as well, uh, because you may remember this story at the end of last year. It, it was a headline across many newspapers and then it was covered in the, the Post magazine in Hong Kong by, uh, by Stuart Eber uh, in a story. I've got a couple of quotes from him afterwards, but you may remember this is the what meant to be illustrations of the Russian ship, Dmitry Donsko, which sank uh, in 1904 in the uh, Russo-Japanese uh, war that was going on at the time, just off the coast of Korea. And a company announced that they had located the wreck using uh, submarines and that they believe that on board was a gold cargo worth about 132 billion US dollars. Um, they came up with a novel way of trying to raise, uh, get the cargo from the wreck, get the gold from the wreck. Um, they issued uh, a Bitcoin, uh, or issued a coin, and a cryptocurrency. And they said, you know, we'll link this cryptocurrency to the value of whatever we recover from the wreck. So there was a bit of an investor frenzy uh, and, uh, you know, it, as I said, it made a number of headlines. About a week or two weeks afterwards, other headlines were raised because, of course, the Korean uh, authorities started to investigate into this company and uh, various issues arose. So it was estimated in some newspaper reports that about 8 million US dollars had been lost by 2,600 investors because, you know, this, this was just a story. I think in Stuart's uh, uh, coverage of it, I like the, the comments of a classic shipwreck con, 
the gullibility of some people can run as deep as any ocean. These are nice quotes about these things have happened on a number of occasions. People have um, tried to get investors involved in this, uh, and many uh, of the stories that we hear about huge treasures uh, being recovered cover up for the many other stories where people have lost lots of money in their search for treasure. There are um, some new cryptocurrencies being issued in the Bahamas linked into plans to actually uh, try to recover, uh, again, wrecks in that area. Um, these are more, well, again, linked into uh, um, ideas of uh, good archaeological practice. One of the issues with the, the Korean venture, of course, was that the, uh, the CEO of that company had asserted there was uh, such a quantity of gold on board the ship that some people had estimated that the ship wasn't big enough to actually carry that sort of uh, uh, cargo. Um, the company had never ever taken any action to try and take ownership of the wreck or any salvage rights to the wreck as well. And of course, the final thing was the CEO asserted that if they did recover the gold, they would have no contest from any other party for ownership of the gold. If it's a Russian state vessel, then I think Mr. Putin would probably have something to say about ownership of the gold. Um, today, we're going to be talking about underwater cultural heritage. So I'd start off by just explaining to you a little bit about what underground cultural heritage is, a couple of other terms that we might use today as well, and then talking about why underwater cultural heritage is important. Then move on to the development of the international legal regime, which is really talking about the law merchant and the law of salvage. And in talking about that and moving up to modern day, we need to talk a little bit, very briefly, about the history of salvage. Then we'll get into the law of salvage talk about some landmark salvage operations because again this, these have developed some of our sort of principles of international law that are being put forward today. In particular um, I'm going to talk about the issues in Southeast Asia. Um, I've only got a couple of slides on the great porcelain treasures but hopefully everyone's heard about these, these great porcelain treasures that were recovered in the 80s and the 90s and that were sold off in big sales in Europe and elsewhere uh, and um, highlighted some of the issues to do with wrecks and underwater cultural heritage in this region. Then we'll talk a little bit more about the development of international law after um, some of these great treasures were found. The law in Hong Kong, um, I'll try and I've tried to put, put together a flow diagram of how I think the law in Hong Kong should work. It's a very basic diagram that comes up in one of the slides and uh, if we've got time I'll try and explain that to you. Um, China, the law in China and China's uh, policy to do with underwater cultural heritage some recent issues we'll finish up with, and then some conclusions. And I'll talk a little bit about where I think international law may go. China, Chinese law, Chinese policy, how China will be involved in the international law. And then again, maybe not how I think Hong Kong will develop, but perhaps how Kong, Hong Kong law should develop and policy should develop in this region. So quite a lot to cover, so I'll try and move through it as quickly as possible. So first of all, that term, underwater cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is a term we hear used every day. And um, when we're thinking about cultural heritage law, well, cultural heritage law is very much a term of international law. And when we're thinking about underwater cultural heritage and underwater cultural heritage law, well, we have got a convention. So we've got a UNESCO convention from 2001, the Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. And this gives us uh, um, a, a non-exhaustive definition of what underwater cultural heritage is. Um, it starts off in the preamble as well of making the important point about why we have this convention that underwater cultural heritage is an integral part of the cultural heritage of humanity. So this is this was the fifth of the international heritage conventions uh, where the emphasis has become in these later uh, uh, cultural heritage conventions, the first one being 54, the latest being in 2003. The latest have been focusing on this idea of uh, cultural heritage belonging to all, um, not ownership of heritage as such, but this is a common heritage for all of us. Um, in, the, uh, uh, in the convention, it explains that underwater cultural heritage is all traces of human existence having a cultural, historical, or archaeological character, which have been partially or totally underwater, periodically or continuously, for at least 100 years, such as sites, structures, buildings, artifacts, and human remains, together with the archaeological and natural context, Vessels, are aircraft, other vehicles, or any part thereof, their cargo or other contents, together with their archaeological and natural context and objects of prehistoric character. So shipwrecks, wrecks and treasure come within this as long as they are over 100 years that they've been underwater or partially underwater. 
other terms that we may use today, uh, some of the admiralty uh, law terms, things like wreck, jetsam, flotsam, lagen, and derelict. I haven't put derelict in there, but again, this is the idea of abandonment, but wreck. Um, again, something cast up on the land by the sea, especially after a shipwreck, a hulk or the ruins of a wrecked ship. Jetsam, the part of a ship, its equipment or its cargo that is cast overboard to lighten the load in time of distress and it sinks or is washed ashore. Flotsam, floating wreckage of a ship or its cargo. And Lagen, goods thrown into the sea with a boy attached that they may be found again. I think the last term is probably the most important there because Lagen gives you this idea that it hasn't been abandoned, that someone does intend to return for it. And in some of the disputes that have arisen over ownership of wreck, particularly in the United States, one of the big issues has been that often the finder has to prove that there's been an abandonment, that the idea that no one was going to return for these, that they haven't tried to salvage. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, so why is underwater cultural heritage important, or is underwater cultural heritage important? Well, a good example to explain its importance in Hong Kong is the wreck of the SS Ventnor. So some of you may have heard of the SS Ventnor. Um, the SS Ventnor was uh, a ship that was uh, coming from New Zealand to Hong Kong back in 1902. Um, it had an unusual cargo on board. Uh, on board, it had the, the remains, the human remains of just under 499 um, Chinese miners. The miners had been working in the gold fields in, in uh, the south and um, had died, had been buried, and a charity, a Chinese charity, had paid for their bodies to be, uh, the remains to be exhumed and for them to be transported back to their home villages in China. Uh, the stop off point was to be Hong Kong. Hong Kong has long been a stop off point in these voyages where human remains are being repatriated to China. And this vessel unfortunately sank uh, just off the coast of New Zealand. Um, it had been known roughly where the wreck was. Uh, but the conditions were such that it was, it was awkward to get to until in 2012, using submersible vehicles, uh, they initially found the wreck, archaeologists, uh, New Zealand archaeologists initially found the wreck. It's important because it shows you what ultra underwater cultural heritage shows us. It tells us a lot about the customs of people at the time. It tells us a lot about the interaction from different peoples. So here we've got the Chinese diaspora, we've got people, uh, Chinese people in New Zealand, but we learn that their custom was still, that after they died, they still wanted to go back to China. And we learn about the charities and the fact that Hong Kong was always a place where uh, people were returned to when they were going back to China, human remains were being returned to as well. The wreck, um, there are issues about the wreck because the wreck didn't get automatic project, uh, protection under uh, New Zealand law. And uh, some people were concerned at the time that the archaeologists would interfere with the human remains. And again, there was an issue about whether the human remains would still be existing after that moment of time in, in that particular water. But the archaeologists were very keen to, to stress that they weren't going to do anything that was disrespectful. And um, in fact, they contacted descendants of the, the miners, the remains that they knew had been on there. And the, um, the descendants were, it seems, very happy with the way that everything was being treated. The archaeologists pressed, and in the end, the New Zealand government did give protection to the wreck. Um, other examples as well, and why it's important, very much it's part of this understanding the interaction between us all, you know, the, the history of the trade between nations. We have strange ideas about, um, you know, nations being isolated. And when you, when you find these wrecks, you see that actually there have been long traditions of trading between different nations. Um, examples there, a 17th century Dutch ship was discovered off the coast of South Africa, which contained Chinese, Japanese, and Persian porcelain, hardwoods, clothes, and oriental amber, all part of that international trade. And uh, an example I particularly like, um, in March 1770, uh, a British vessel, the HMS Swift, sank uh, in an estuary um, off Argentina. It had been down to the Falklands, it had been across, and it's unfortunately uh, hit a rock, uh, the captain tried to bring it into uh, an estuary to actually sort of beach it, but unfortunately hit another rock, uh, and things went sort of terribly wrong from there. He did manage to get near to the shore. The wreck sank. Uh, he managed to get most of his crew off. In fact, only, only three members of the crew died. Um, most of them survived. There were then, you know, this heroic story about some of the crew getting into a longboat and actually making a long journey to, to actually find another British vessel and bringing people, uh, the vessel back and actually saving the rest of the crew. Well, um, local divers in the 1990s identified the scene of the wreck. And again, it's a good example of 
and recreational divers working with archaeologists. They, they found the site of the wreck, they, they notified archaeologists, and an archaeological team was put together, which involved Argentine archaeologists and British archaeologists as well. And they worked on the wreck. In 2005, they had a bit of a surprise as they were working on the wreck. They didn't expect to find any human remains, but they did. They found a, a human foot bone and then, of course, immediately stopped work, planned again, thought about what they've been doing, and in the end, they recovered two skeletons from the wreck. Uh, and it's a good example, again, of uh, how perhaps heritage can bring people together. Because in the end, those two skeletons were identified as two members of the crew, uh, and they were given uh, uh, military burials in Argentina with uh, members of uh, uh, the British military there as well, which if you know the record between Argentina and Britain is uh, quite a remarkable thing as well. So uh, an interesting sort of, uh, again, point of why underwater cultural heritage is so important. If we're thinking about the, the development of, uh, of, sorry, and there's some other points as well, you know, one of the issues that archaeologists say about why underwater cultural heritage is so important is because of where it is located, there is a good chance that it is untouched, that they've got a chance to actually see uh, information that would otherwise have been lost. If we think about things that have been left on, on, on land, then of course often man has interfered with them. Although of course when ships have sunk in the past, there have often been attempts to salvage, they can be quite limited attempts. Uh, and um, unless the, the, you know, the water or the other conditions have affected us, then we could have a situation where you find things as they did in the Black Sea. We have something which is remarkably well preserved. Um, so that means that we, we find treasure, uh, treasure in many different ways. It can be the gold, it can be the silver, but also it's the knowledge value of the underwater cultural heritage and the things that they actually evidence. There is an economic value because a lot of these treasures have been sold off. They have a financial value as well. Um, they also have an economic value, as I said, because again, today there is a huge heritage industry. So in some places now you can swim on some of these wrecks, you can go down and dive on them. And there are huge local industries involved in the heritage to do with these wrecks as well. And of course, that final point, there is huge political significance in underwater cultural heritage as well. And many nations have been using heritage in that way. In fact, the identification of cultural heritage is often political in itself. So we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So the development of international legal regimes. Um, if we think about the law merchant and the law of salvage, well, as, a, as an equity man, this is really quite foreign to me, or well, at least that's what I originally thought. Um, but if you're thinking about the common law, really, this is, this is really outside of the common law. This is a very interesting area of the law when we think about English common law, uh, and how it interacts with it. The, the development of the law merchant and how it actually interacts with English law has much to do with one particular um, wreck. Uh, because although um, there were old laws, Roman laws dealing with uh, salvage, um, really the first sort of uh, laws that we can consider to be the basis for our modern law of salvage probably came, were, were introduced into the common law system because of one particular wreck. And that's the wreck of the white ship. So has everyone heard of the wreck of the white ship? Uh, the white ship was, um, I, I remember listening to a radio program once, where it was described as the, uh, the most well-known shipwreck of the, uh, the 12th century. Uh, at the time I thought, does anyone know of any other shipwreck of the 12th century? <laughs> but it is the most well-known shipwreck of the 12th century. So what we've got, we've got a, a shipwreck in 1120, um, it was an important shipwreck because this is Henry I and his son, his heir, was on the white ship. The story is they were coming back from Normandy to England, uh, the, the heir apparent uh, and his friends had got quite drunk uh, and drinking and seafaring seemed to go together and don't really seem to be very successful. Uh, they encouraged the captain to sail when he didn't really want to sail and of course things went terribly wrong. Uh, I think the only person who survived, I seem to remember from the story, I think was the was a butcher who was on board, and uh, he he managed to, managed to cling to some wreckage or whatever else. He was the only one who was saved from the wreck. Henry was devastated, and if you know anything about English history about what happened afterwards, why this is important for England and common law, of course, is the fact that Henry's daughter Matilda uh, was meant to be queen, uh, but of course her cousin Stephen. Uh, seized the throne, and we ended up in England with that terrible period, which uh, has been referred to as one of the most devastating periods of English history, the, the first English 
civil war. Um, why is it important to the common law? Well, of course, in the end, Stephen and Matilda came to, well, they didn't come to an, uh, an agreement, but Stephen came to an agreement with uh, Matilda's son, uh, another Henry, Henry II, the lawyer king, probably one of the people who really developed the English common law. For our purposes, for uh, the law merchant uh, and the law of salvage, what was important is that his wife was Eleanor of Aquitaine, and Eleanor of Aquitaine, very famous uh, as a queen for the many different things she did, originally married to the French king. She went on crusade, and apparently while she was on crusade, uh, ideas came to her about we needed some sort of um, uh, law of the sea, law merchant to deal with trading on the sea and, and how uh, things should operate. Uh, and uh, she uh, adopted uh, in 1150 in France, uh, the, what are referred to as the rules, the roles, the law of Oleron in France. Uh, and of course, when she became eventually Queen of England, um, after her husband, Henry II, had died, while her son was on one of his numerous trips abroad, uh, she was regent, and in 1190, she actually um, uh, proclaimed the, these rules in England as well. They became the basis of what became really admiralty law in England, the, you know, the law merchant, the laws of the sea. Um, and here is Article 29 from the Rules of Oleron. The bill in bold just explains to you uh, the lord of that place or country by his own interest and by those under his power and jurisdiction ought to be aiding, assisting to the said distressed merchants or mariners in saving their shipwreck goods and that without the least embezzlement or taking any part thereof from the right owners. But however, there may be a remuneration or consideration for salvage to, to such as take pains therein, according to right reason, a good conscience and as justice shall appoint. It seems that the general practice of local lords was whenever a ship wrecked on your shore, you just helped yourself. If the mariners are there, you would, well, either kill them or if they were worth something, ransom them off. And this was part of the of these sort of laws that were meant to do with encouraging and protecting international trade. And built into them was this concept, which today we recognize as salvage. The idea that, you know, you, you don't go and plunder you go and save for, and that's what salvage is actually about, saving for, and then being entitled to a reward afterwards as well. So that's really where I think the principles of salvage uh, came into uh, English law, in the law of merchant. Um, it becomes part of the law of merchant, maritime law, and of course that was the jurisdiction of the Admiralty Courts in England. Again, more of an equitable principle, possibly because it's often been described as foreign law. So common lawyers would often describe this as foreign law, and equity, I think they often regard as foreign law as well. Uh, until we get to the middle of the 18th century and Lord Mansfield, who's responsible for so many things uh, to do with developments in the common law, uh, really developed, uh, brought the maritime law really more into uh, the common law of England, the law merchant as well. He actually acknowledged maritime law is not the law of a particular country, but the general law of nations. So this is one of the first real international laws that you actually uh, get developed there. Lord Mansfield also developed the law of insurance, which is very linked into, of course, maritime trade and salvage as well. The development of the law of salvage then really followed on after that by the ability to actually salvage, to actually be able to get things back. Because if we think originally, um, very limited forms of salvage available or being able to. Um, uh, I know the Dean yesterday referred to the fact that when I mentioned something about diving, he said, isn't that where you guys just grab a big rock and jump into the sea uh, or whatever else and go down as far as you can, hold your breath. And, and of course, that often was uh, what, what things were limited to originally. So we'll, we'll look at that very quickly. But um, it's really the development of the laws to do with salvage have been uh, based upon how salvage is developed. And of course, salvage developed according to, well, the value of cargoes against the risk in actually recovering. These were the, the, the sort of quantifications that had to be made, the, uh, the calculations that had to be made. Technology was the big thing. The developments in technology have pushed the law on because new uh, scenarios have arisen. As today, we see law trying to catch up with technology. That's also a bit of tradition as well. And of course, very much linked into insurance. Because if you've got someone who's insured a vessel, if it's lost, the insurers then have an interest, if they have to pay out, in trying to recover what they can to offset their losses. So these were uh, uh, important issues in the history of salvage. So a very quick thing on salvage. Um, it's often been said that the first ship launched sank. And I think you can develop on from that. You know, If we say the first ship launched sank, it's probably very likely that someone tried to save it or tried to get anything of value from it. 
Uh, and that's really the whole concept of, of trying to get things back, treasure hunting and salvage as well. And of course, as people had new ideas about what they could do, if they knew there was a wreck there, they would come back and keep on trying if they thought there was something of value there. So technology then, one of the most important drivers in the development of the law of salvage. Um, really, I think probably one of the most important developments is the diving bell. Uh, and then, of course, diving suits with replenishing air. And of course, probably the thing that changed everything, the aquamar, the scuba diving, being able to uh, independently move around underwater. Other developments in recent years, side sands, scan sonar, uh, these uh, seabed penetrating radars, all of these things as well. But most recently, of course, it's these remotely operating vessels, and of course, even now, these autonomous remote vessels as well. So we don't even have to worry about someone uh, actually operating them. They can actually use artificial intelligence to guide themselves. So uh, if we think of the diving bell, some of you may have heard the story of Alexander the Great, uh, back in, was it 300 BC, uh, using a diving bell in the Mediterranean. Um, unfortunately, this is a medieval manuscript version of this, and it's probably a fallacy as well. The idea is that it never happened. This just uh, suited a, a medieval narrative, so that's probably not true. In fact, the sort of first recorded instances we have of, of uses of the diving bell are really from the middle of the 17th century. Uh, so here we've got uh, an illustration and a reproduction of an early diving bell, and you've got to give these guys credit if they actually went down in these things. It must have been very, very scary working in that sort of circumstance. Um, you know, a, a sort of metal bell that literally has a weight underneath that drags you down. You stand inside and stand there for as long as you've got some, some air coming there to you there and try and retract things. Um, first instance that, that's well known is the, the Vasa. Uh, the Vasa was um, a Swedish ship um, which had sunk in uh, Stockholm Harbour. Um, one of the usual stories again at the time. I always think this reminds me of, uh, of Henry VIII as well. The king at the time had uh, been very instrumental in the design of this particular building. He'd sort of taken over from the ship designers and started adding more guns and more things and everything else, and not thought of the, the general principle that if you put too much boys at the top, it will just sort of tip over in the end. So um, the ship had, had capsized and sunk in Stockholm Harbour uh, about, that's in 1628, about 40 or so years uh, later, um, a uh, someone was hired to try and retrieve, and they, they did manage to retrieve some of the guns and other things of value from the wreck using diving bells. Another instance, uh, a few years after this, uh, is a very famous one of probably the world's first famous treasure hunters. So this character, Sir William Phipps, um, I think he was born originally in America, but was a, a, or in what would have been the American states at the time, but a British citizen, um, a bit of a sort of, again, a, a, a colourful character, probably what we consider to be a pirate today. Uh, is given some letters uh, of authority by Charles II to go and search for sunken treasure from the Spanish um, treasure fleets around the Caribbean. And again, uses a diving bell and managed to retrieve at the time a huge quantity of, of silver coinage from one of the sunken uh, silver uh, Spanish vessels, um, which, uh, which gave him great wealth, which allowed him to become very influential in the Americas afterwards as well. And of course, um, uh, actually, the recovery of this treasure has been uh, credited with various things, with issues to do with joint stock uh, uh, companies, which happened shortly afterwards, and even the founding of the Bank of uh, uh, the Bank of England may have had something to do with this money coming over. So, um, other notable events: the first replenishable air diving suits, the ability for people to actually walk around. Um, if you go to the Maritime Museum which is quite nearby, and I always recommend everyone to go to the Maritime Museum. Um, you will see some of these sort of uh, the suits that are, are still being used today, and have been used quite recently, and some of the reproductions of the older suits, and you'll see how cumbersome they are. But if we think about that, contrasting it with the diving bell, but of course, mm -hmm. a lot more mobility. Um, first uh, important wreck probably used on was the Royal George, sank in the, in the 1782, but in the 1830s, uh, we get a, a salvage attempt using divers. Um, important in the history of diving as well, because this is the, the first time really that a, a buddy diving system was introduced, was in the salvage attempts on the Royal George. And um, the first emergency ascent has been recorded as well, when, a, when a, uh, the, the air cable got tangled and a diver had to come up. And the first recorded medical treatment of a diver squeeze as well, so important in diving history. 
There are various developments in these suits, and eventually we do get the development of suits which have their own air containers with them, but again, quite cumbersome. And then we come, of course, to the end of the Second World War, where we get Jacques Cousteau, and we get the development of the Aqualung, and we get our first um, self-contained uh, um, units uh, for underwater breathing apparatus, scuba. And really that sort of transformed everything because it gave um, people access to the sea relatively easily and relatively cheaply as well, and they could go and explore. So lots of things changed. If we think about the, the law of salvage then, and then sort of come through back to those sort of developments, what is the law of salvage? Well, general principle is this. The law of salvage is um, the wreck is, is subject to this. And we have two types of salvage, pure and contract salvage. Most salvage is contract salvage, which is where people have agreed and have a contract and agreement to actually recover. Often with the, the shipwreck, uh, sorry, the treasure salvage, we're really looking at pure salvage. This is where people have come across a wreck and are hoping, I suppose, that no one is going to claim it, no one else owns it and they are just going to recover this without the contract being there. So pure salvage, when we think about this, um, one of the, the problems is that the concepts of salvage in different jurisdictions, even though we have these sort of international ideas, and there are differences. It's, it's not really a law which gives ownership of a wreck to discoverer, um, but it has this idea that we will encourage you to recover, we will encourage you to try and help in, in first of all, saving ships, but then in recovering ships or their cargo, um, by giving uh, a, an economic reward. That's the idea, um, to try and encourage people to save. Um, it's about efforts to save ships or cargo in peril. Um, and of course, one of the issues that's been raised about the treasure wrecks is, uh, well, are they actually in peril? If you've got a wreck at the, at the bottom of the sea, which has sat there for hundreds of years, and then you've got someone at Salvo coming forward saying, I want to recover that cargo, uh, you have to usually establish it's in peril. And the usual way of doing that is, well, it's deteriorating in the waters. But of course, many archaeologists have pointed out that the treasure hunters are often causing more peril than the waters have ever caused to these particular wrecks as well. Um, other issues to do with salvage. Um, generally, state vessels, there are issues with state vessels. So uh, military vessels, uh, non-commercial vessels uh, flying under a state flag. And usually the states uh, have tried to retain control of those and will either enter into contracts for salvage or, or will prohibit salvage of those vessels as well. And of course, the other issue that comes into all of these is often these wrecks have got, have had human remains on them. Uh, and some people often say these wrecks should be uh, categorised as, as graves, particularly the ones that are involved in, the, in battles, they should be considered to be war graves as well. Um, treasure hunters then, what are they really looking for? Well, they're looking for anything, I suppose, if they can get a reward, if they can share in the recovery. But a lot of the time, they're looking for the unidentified, the unclaimed, or the abandoned. And again, that concept of abandon, much more a feature of the US uh, concept of salvage law. The US salvage law also recognised what's known as the law of fines. So the idea that if we have got a situation where we can't identify who actually um, owns the wreck, uh, perhaps what the, you know, can't identify the wreck itself, then the finder would be entitled to, as one of my critics, uh, colleagues put it under the sort of the law of finders keepers uh, keep the wreck and anything on it. Development of the law of salvage as well linked into insurance law and uh, those of you familiar with insurance law to do with salvage will know that uh, today when we have contracts uh, uh, salvage it's usually on the basis where there are various different forms but I think still the most popular is the Lloyd's form. Um, that developed in the 1890s and as I said earlier really linked into that concept of insurers uh, of course, wanting to try and recover something to minimise their losses. Um, in the 1890s, the story is that a Lloyd representative uh, had to go out to the Dardanelles because there'd been a series of wrecks in that area and uh, there, were a, there was a family in the Dardanelles who were operating and recovering wrecks and they uh, were charging exorbitant fees. So he managed to go out there and negotiate with this family who'd been charging exorbitant fees in the past that they would now submit themselves to a Lloyd's form, or the Lloyd's open form, as it's sometimes referred to, and um, and they would then, Lloyd's would agree with them or, or tell them what the salvage, uh, what their reward would be. So he must have been a very good negotiator anyway. He managed to do this. Eventually, this became the sort of standard form as of 1908, and it's still the form that's really used predominantly today. The latest version is the, uh, the Lloyd's form from 2011. The law of salvage 
became really on an international basis with the Brussels Convention in 1910. Uh, and that's really codified many of those principles that had already come from uh, uh, the law of the sea, the, the maritime law anyway. Um, one important provision had usually been the concept of no cure, no pay. The idea that if you didn't actually recover something, you didn't save something, you didn't get any uh, reward. Um, things have changed today. Uh, we now have a 1989 International Convention on Salvage, which incorporates the developments that came about in the 1970s and 1980s, because no cure, no pay was fine, um, but there were times when we actually wanted people to try and attempt to save vessels, uh, not so much for what they could save, but for the damage they could prevent. In the 1970s and the 1980s, we had those big oil disasters with the big oil tankers, and um, the idea was we needed to change the concept of salvage, but sometimes it didn't matter if you didn't actually save anything, you didn't actually recover anything, but if you were doing something which would minimize damage, then you should be entitled to uh, a reward as well. So that's all incorporated in the uh, 1989 uh, convention, which we'll come back to later on because Hong Kong has actually um, incorporated that into its own law. So we'll talk about that when we talk about Hong Kong. The concept of underwater cultural heritage then, that international law concept in the convention, um, how does that fit with the concept of treasure and salvage? Well, Craig Forrest, and uh, I've put a list of some references down there, but Craig Forrest uh, is an Australian academic who writes in this area, written a number of articles, uh, a recent article I reference in there where he talks about uh, China and uh, uh, underwater cultural heritage as well, which is a, a great article on that area. But he's written again about this in the past and said, well, actually, you know, underwater cultural heritage and salvage don't go together, particularly the idea of the American concept of the law of fines are taking, because if we remember back to that convention, the emphasis there is this is part of our sort of common heritage, the common cultural heritage of all mankind. And as we'll see, the convention emphasizes the idea that we don't want to talk about ownership of wrecks, uh, whereas salvage is about reward, is about exploitation, is about ownership. So really, these things don't go together. Um, the general concepts of salvage have always been if we identify a wreck, if the owners can be traced, then they may have a claim on the wreck and the contents, and the salvage should be liable to the reward. Um, unless there's a reason not to recover, and again, I said this about, say, state vessels or, or vessels that are graves, and the International Convention, the general principles of salvage have always contained this provision that the owners may prohibit salvage, may say, no, we don't want you to recover that as well. If there are no identifiable owners, as I said, the American law has been the general concept of finders keepers. In other jurisdictions, different approaches to that. If we think about um, the UK, uh, in, in British waters, of course, wreck was often a prerogative of the crown. So the concept was the crown uh, owned the wreck. Uh, and again, if there was a salvage operation, that would be usually in negotiation with the crown, the salvers uh, saving this for the crown or perhaps selling off and sharing uh, whatever they got from the proceeds of wreck. Uh, with the Crown as well. Um, there have been some landmark salvage operations which again have helped in this sort of development of principles to do with salvage law. In the 20th century, probably these are, are I think some of the most important and then coming into the 21st century, I mentioned one of the most important recent cases to do with a, a treasure hoard. Um, in at the end of the Second World War, of course, the, the German fleet uh, uh, was, um, the German fleet sank itself in Scapa Flow and um, there was a huge uh, operation um, to recover some of these ships and, the, and the, the metals from the ships between 1922 and 1939. So I'll put a, uh, a slide showing that very shortly and I'll say a little bit more. 1942, of course, Pearl Harbor, the operations to, uh, to clear up the harbor and also to refloat and repair some of the boats, some of the, the ships, and of course to take steel and other things from some of the others. Uh, 1961, the Vasa wreck that we mentioned earlier with the diving bell, um, there was an operation to recover that in 1961. And 1971, I mentioned there the Hollandia, I'll come back to that very shortly. This was a vessel that sank in 1743 off the Scilly Islands, uh, just to the, the south of, uh, of the British Isles. 1982 is probably the one, was the one I always remember as the first sort of important wreck and seeing a wreck being raised on television is the Mary Rose. 1985, um, this is a, a, a treasure wreck um, that was recovered by an American treasure hunter, so we'll come back to that. And then, of course, one of the most important influences on the history of the development of principles to protect underwater cultural heritage has to be the identification in 1985 of the Titanic, of the wreck of the Titanic. 
More recently, we'll come to this, the, the, the Black Swan Project, which was a, a treasure that was recovered from the Atlantic in 2007. So this is a, um, a postcard which shows the salvage operation at Scapa Flow. Um, a huge operation, one of the biggest salvage operations that had ever been undertaken at the time. There's still an operation going on at, at present because metals that are in the, the battleships at Scapa Flow um, are very important for certain scientific uh, um, instruments because they they were sank pre the detonation of the uh, of the atomic bombs, so they're not affected by any radiation. So that the metals there are still uh, considered to be very valuable, and there still is a, a limited sort of recovery of metals from there. Pearl Harbor, of course, again huge operation. It gives us these huge technological advances in actually being able to recover huge ships and being able to at times refloat them so the technology developed very quickly and then uh, in 1961 we get the uh, recovery of the wreck of the Vassa in Stockholm Harbour that we mentioned earlier and again a huge operation something that people hadn't thought was possible uh, the recovery of it the building of a museum for it and again it starts to give us this idea of, of what sort of things are out there what can be done and again how you can exploit this underwater cultural heritage how much people are interested in it as well uh, as i mentioned before the uh, uh, hollandia ship uh, is a ship that uh, um, sank uh, back in the 18th century of the Scilly islands i put this one in because again it was a, a, a wreck that was recovered didn't have all of the difficulties that many other wrecks have in the recovery um, huge number of silver coins, 35,000 of these silver coins were recovered. Um, I actually got one in my office out there, one of these coins as well. I'm not sure I should own up to that, but I have. I should have brought it in so I could show you. Um, but the, why I think this is an interesting wreck, one, because it was, it was quite easy to recover, and two, because the person who recovered it, the person who led the treasure hunting expedition, was an English London lawyer. And he was a lawyer who got so fed up with being a lawyer that he decided to go off and be a treasure hunter. <laughs> if anyone in the audience is thinking about that, we'll come to the problems of becoming a treasure hunter today uh, a little bit later on. But yeah, he, he, uh, he did search for other wrecks afterwards. I think he found one other wreck, but he never had as, as much luck as he had when he found the Hollandia and recovered all those coins. If you go online, there's a lovely video of uh, the sale of the coins at Christie's where they have these huge boxes of coins being sold off. But again, um, black and white video. Um, the Mary Rose, again, such an important recovery. Uh, I remember watching this on television. Um, I was due to be in lectures at my university at the time, but I decided not to go to the lectures. I still think it was a good choice, much better to watch the recovery. It meant to be recovered early in the morning, but I remember watching all day as they were trying to bring this up. You know, this, this sort of skeleton built around the wreck, very, you know, very developed technology to actually do this. The divers digging under, putting things under to actually get a cradle to lift the rock out, uh, the wreck out. And of course, the ongoing preservation even today. So very important things learned from the wreck, um, new interpretation of what actually happened when the Mary Rose sank back in 1545. It didn't sink on its maiden voyage. It's often said it was its maiden voyage. It was, a, it was an old ship even at the time. But um, lots of things learned from the wreck, lots of things learned about recovery and underwater archaeology as well. So very important recovery. Mel Fisher. Um, I mentioned that huge American treasure. Um, I think Mel Fisher, uh, again, a number of archaeologists in the audience, so he's not a very popular character, I think, in archaeologists generally. Um, he has got, well, there is a museum. I mean, he, he died a few years ago. There is a Mel Fisher Museum, isn't there, in the States? Um, purely exploitation. Uh, and the big issue with these treasure hunters has always been the fact that they find a wreck and the first thing we're going to do is, is get rid of everything and just find the treasure. You know, there's no recording, there's no uh, analysis of any data, there's no recording of any data in the first place. So big problem with you know, just disturbing, losing all of that information. Um, the um, issues, Mel Fisher, uh, I think really this big treasure we found back in 1985, I think highlighted a number of things. The first was that um, treasure ships in that particular area, this was probably one of the last big ones that was going to be found. Um, the attitudes of the courts were starting to change as well in the States. And of course, it then became an issue of, well, let's look elsewhere. Let's look for jurisdictions where there might be other treasure ships and we might have more compliant jurisdictions, jurisdictions we can work in. And I think that's why the emphasis changed out to Asia. And 1985, of course, we had the Titanic um, you know, identification of a wreck, no one had ever felt they'd ever be able to find the wreck. 
when the photographs came back, uh, and of course the recovery of items from the wreck as well. It raised many legal issues, and it raised that issue again of the fact that no wreck was really going to be safe in the future. Anyone could actually get to it. Um, this is the Black Swan treasure, uh, and again, some of you may know about this. 2007, we hear the stories about this, but we'll come to that a little bit later on, although I see I'm rapidly sort of running out of time here, so I'm move forward. The Southeast Asia, I, I think focus changed in the 80s, and of course the, the, the most famous treasures that we see in the 1980s being identified uh, are these great porcelain treasures in Southeast Asia. Um, recovery of things like the Nanking cargo, um, they've been the Hatcher Hall the year before, Mike Hatcher was the character is, is always pointed to, to do with these particular recoveries. Huge quantities of Chinese porcelain and other porcelains as well. Um, at the time, I have to confess that uh, I was an antique stealer, uh, and um, I remember friends in London at the time pooling money together to go off to the sale in Amsterdam to try and buy lots, because the lots were multiple lots, multiple pieces of porcelain, to try and get together to bring these things back and sell. And they, and they sold for uh, considerable sums, very collectible, still collectible today. You can buy things at quite reasonable prices. I'm not advocating anyone buy these things today because there are question marks. Uh, about buying them, but um, uh, stories that came out of this probably uh, very important in the development of China's policy towards underwater cultural heritage. Um, if you the reference to Nina Yu's uh, uh, articles uh, are on the reference sheet as well. You talk if you if you look at other things to do with the development of underwater cultural heritage policy in China. Um, often it's pointed to the fact that these porcelain treasures. Uh, possibly started China's recognition of how important the underwater cultural heritage was and highlighted the issues to do with it where they needed to do something about their laws and their policy. Um, one, of the, one of the stories that told about this is that the Chinese government at the time wanted to purchase or wanted to get some of these examples. They said, this is Chinese porcelain, we'd like some examples from some of the tricks and contacted Hatcher, and of course he's, he's supposed to have famously said, no problem, Christie's Amsterdam, that's where you go to buy them. <laughs> and of course, that didn't go down too well. It particularly didn't go down too well because apparently the government did send some people there and they didn't have enough money to actually buy some of these things. So again, that sort of highlights the issues. Um, the Vong Tao cargo, other cargoes as well. I'll put a little sort of table together there, the famous ones, you know, the, the Hatcher cargo in 84, 25,000 pieces, Nanking cargo, 150,000 pieces. Vung Tao cargo, 42,000 pieces. The Hoi An hoard, a quarter of a million pieces. And of course, most recently, I think one of the most famous, the Tek Sing, 1999, um, sometimes referred to as China's Titanic, a huge vessel. And the recovery from that of over 360,000 pieces, porcelain and other items as well. Again, you know, I think the importance of that one is it, it's a wreck that we know quite a lot about because of course there were records about what happened at the time. It was only 1822. So, um, uh, and again, raised all these issues about should people just be going to take these things? Should they just be going out there recovering and then taking them to, and I'm not blaming Christie's, but we'll just say Christie's Amsterdam. We do notice there was a change later on. Christie's, uh, I think, decided that they weren't going to be too involved in these recoveries. International law then, well, the development of international law flows, it developed around that period, it's been ongoing. The, the first really important provisions are in the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, agreed in 1982 but came into effect in 1984. Uh, it's a, a law which just designates maritime sea zones. It's meant to deal with freedom of movement across Asians, rights to do with uh, uh, states' laws, coastal states' laws and other states' laws within certain regions. So it designates different uh, regions. And very quickly, usually uh, a state will have a territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles from the baseline. The baseline is the, is the sort of the, the mark between low water and high water on the coast. And, and again, there are many uh, provisions in the, in the law which actually specify how you decide where the baseline line is. But we're talking about really 12 nautical miles. Then there's a, a, a further zone, a buffer region, the contiguous uh, zone, another 12 nautical miles. Uh, and um, of course, if we've got states which are uh, island states, uh, a series of islands, the archipelagic uh, states, 
Uh, then you can draw your baseline around the outer, outer edges of the islands, even though they may be some distance apart, as it says there, and have a zone within the archipelago over which you have sovereignty. And for our regions, that's important for places like the Philippines and, of course, Indonesia. Um, apart from that sort of territorial Z and the contiguous zone, other zones that are identified, the exclusive economic zone, which is a 200-mile zone from your baseline, which is for economic exploitation restricts to the coastal states the right to economically exploit them. The continental shelf, uh, which can go out to 350 miles if you haven't got a continental shelf, if it extends that far, then you can claim exploitation rights up to that uh, point as well. Um, and um, again, there's a, there's a clarification of what you can use it for. The, um, the maritime zones then carry on by referencing to what's called the high seas. All parts of the sea that are not including the exclusive economic zone and the territorial sea or the internal waters of a state. Uh, and then the area. The area is a very strange idea, isn't it? This concept of the area. It sounds, it sounds like something from a, a science fiction movie. Um, the area is the seabed and the ocean floor and the subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national uh, jurisdiction. Um, why is this important for uh, underwater cultural heritage? Well, we do get reference in uh, Junkos Two underwater cultural heritage. Article 303 talks about archaeological and historical objects found at sea and talks about states having a duty to protect them. However, the very important thing to remember there is it references it to Article 33, which really restricts things to within the contiguous zone. So we're really talking about this idea of states perhaps having a duty to protect objects, uh, but it will really be within those sort of the contiguous zone, the, the point from 12 to 24 miles out. The area also, there's some reference there to do with uh, underwater cultural heritage. It talks generally about that sort of seabed area outside of the state's jurisdiction being um, part of the common heritage of all mankind and says that archaeological and historical uh, uh, objects found in that area shall be preserved or disposed of for the benefit of mankind as a whole. So it seems to suggest that there should be some sort of protection for all these, but of course it doesn't really give any protection. It suggests that you should do this. It's more, I think, uh, evoking hope than anything else. Uh, and then we get the Convention itself on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage from 2001, which I mentioned before. This one um, was, as it says there, designed to try and uh, impress everyone with the importance of underwater cultural heritage. Basic enforcement of the provisions is this idea of a shared responsibility for all states. Again, moving on quickly. Um, what does it deal with? It deals with rules for investigation and protection of underwater cultural heritage specifies that the law of salvage is not to apply, specifies this, no commercial exploitation of underwater cultural heritage, in situ preservation is the first option, not recovering wrecks as well. Um, so an important convention with a purpose of trying to encourage people to protect underwater cultural heritage, um, but how does it really, you know, as it says there, the, the state parties have certain duties they can recover, uh, underwater cultural heritage that's been uh, recovered already inconsistently with the convention and everything else. But UNESCO itself says it doesn't regulate the ownership of wrecks, nor does it change existing maritime zones. So it works with the new uh, class, with the law of the sea. Um, and how successful is it? Well, if we think about the international conventions, if we think about the three which really come into play here, underwater convention, on, uh, sorry, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Convention on Salvage, and the convention to do with the underwater uh, uh, cultural heritage. Um, I put together just a little list so you can see of the regions. In this region, if you start thinking about which which states or territories are parties uh, or are <coughs> to these particular conventions, uh, and you can see that when it comes to the protection of underwater cultural heritage convention, the only state in this region is Cambodia, which actually is signed up to those. Um, if we are thinking about the former colonial powers who are really active in this area, the only two states who've signed up to it are Portugal and Spain. In fact, most states have signed up to the, um, uh, the Law of the Sea and quite a few to the Salvage Convention. And of course, the Salvage Convention is just to do with rights between parties as to recover re recovery of property as well. Why is it an issue uh, to do with these particular conventions as well? If you want to see why underwater cultural heritage is really uh, an issue, you have to start thinking about how UNCLOS has affected the territories, the sea territories of the states in this particular region. This is a map which is, which is meant to show you the territorial implications of the law of the sea for the world. This is a map of our region. 
where most of the, the shipwrecks that really have come into question in recent years have been found. And this is how new class affects them. That's how the map becomes if you start looking at the territories. So we can see things like um, these hatch lines here are disputed regions of, uh, of ownership as well. Uh, and we can see that you know, we get all these overlaps coming up between these particular states as well. Philippines having this huge sort of uh, archipelago region as well over there and dispute with China and other states. So you can see quite confusing how it all works out there. Hong Kong, um, well, Hong Kong has got a long tradition of the sea. Hong Kong only really exists, doesn't it? It existed as a British colony because of the sea. Um, if you go to the Hong Kong Discovery Center over in the, uh, the park, Carolyn Park over there, you can walk on this floor, this glass floor, which has all of this porcelain that was recovered from Penny's Bay. So you can see that we have got uh, quite a lot of uh, links to the sea as well. Uh, and of course, Hong Kong, surrounded by the sea, lots of people still living on the sea as well. Um, pirates, we've got a tradition of pirates. Uh, Hong Kong, the islands of Hong Kong were originally referred to by the Portuguese as the islands of thieves. And of course, we've had elements in the history of this area where, of course, people have been moved away from the, um, the coast because they were thought to be supporting the pirates. So we had the great clearance orders and everything else. And our own very famous local pirate. For a few years ago, I believe someone was trying to find uh, some of the treasure that was meant to be associated with him. Um, Maritime Museum, again, I recommend anyone to go to the Maritime Museum and see uh, the displays there which talk about the history of this area and its links with the sea. Early salvage in the region, there are two, I found two recorded cases in, in this region of uh, salvage attempts. Uh, in 1802, uh, we get this um, uh, Spanish vessel, uh, which is uh, cast on the shore uh, by the east coast of Quantong, as it says there, plundered by locals. The Spanish uh, are, are sort of stranded. They plead for help for the English, uh, and the English, of course, send a ship which uh, salvaged 66,000 Spanish dollars. But of course, we do charge for that, so there's a salvage fee payable. 1802, of course, the, the modest uh, court fire uh, of Wampo, as it says there. And again, scuttled to save treasure on board. Um, some of it was recovered later by divers. So even in those early days, there were recovery attempts as well. More recently, the big salvage operations at the end of the Second World War to clear the harbour. At the end of the war, there were so many wrecks in the harbour that, of course, one of the first jobs to be done was to try to clear things up. Another famous wreck. Uh, you may remember, uh, if you watch any James Bond films, then I don't think there really was an office for M on board or whatever else. It so. was a university at the time as well, wasn't it? So, um, our legal framework then, our jurisdiction, we've got a three mile where we can jurisdiction. Um, and the laws that would really come into play in Hong Kong to do with wrecks, these three, the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, the Merchant Shipping Collision Damage Liability and Salvage Ordinance, uh, really because it incorporates that interna international convention on salvage into Hong Kong's laws and the environmental impact assessment ordinance. Um, so, we'll go through them first. The first one I think you'd have to consider is if any wreck was discovered, is it affected by the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance? And that offers a protection or a recognition in two ways. The first is, is it an antiquity or a relic? So we'll come to that very shortly. And the second is, has it been designated by the Antiquities Authority as a proposed monument or a monument? So if you think about the antiquities or, mod or relics, provisions in there saying that if anyone discovers an antiquity or a relic in Hong Kong, you have to report it. Okay, there is, there is a duty in the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance to report antiquities or relics or, or supposed antiquities. So even if you suspect something is an antiquity, you have a duty to report it. It prohibits searching for antiquities without a license. So again, you have to go to the Antiquities Authority to actually get your licenses. There are problems with the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance because it's quite an old ordinance. Um, it was drafted in the early, well, it was actually drafted originally in the early 1960s, but the 1970s, it actually uh, uh, came before LegCo, came into effect in 76. It's an old ordinance, written at the time when underwater um, uh, archeology span was in, infancy really, but the things that were going on today weren't even imagined. Um, and of course, again, a lack of appreciation of underwater cultural heritage. A focus, if anything, would have been on treasure, and the concept at the time was there's not going to be any treasure in this, this particular region uh, around Hong Kong. 
However, it does cover underwater cultural heritage because in sec section two, it talks about the discovery of antiquities uh, and says it covers um, finding of antiquities in Hong Kong in or on or under land or sea or attached to or within the fabric or foundations of a structure in on or under land or sea. So it does cover um, anything under the sea. It defines an antiquity as a relic uh, and a place building site or structure erected, formed or built by human agency before the year 1800. So it would cover any vessel, any wreck, anything that's been thrown from a wreck uh, that was uh, uh, created before 1800. But of course, most of the things that have gone on, well, there are things that have operated before 1800 in this region, of course. And we have found wrecks from before that in this region and quite recently. But um, everything that happened after the founding of Hong Kong as a colony doesn't come under this as being automatically regarded as an antiquity. Um, and relic, well, again, it uses that year 1800. Um, I've never really found out the reason why the year 1800 was used as a sort of a, a guide date, but that's the use it uses there. Um, if we do discover uh, antiquities, then as I said, you've got to report them. There may be a reward for reporting them. Prohibit, uh, you have to have a license to search for them. And any relic, any antiquity found in Hong Kong vests in Hong Kong. Okay, so anything found after the commencement date of the um, ordinance belongs to Hong Kong. But the authority may disclaim. So again, it may be that something would be found that the authority wouldn't want, but so it could be disclaimed, particularly for museums and others. Um, the other way of protection would be, of course, if the uh, Antiquities Authority today, that's the Secretary for Development, um, declared any, any site, any structure, a proposed monument, and of course that's with the view for eventually making it into a monument. And the grounds for actually uh, declaring something to be a monument should be that it's of historical, archaeological, or paleontological uh, significance. So if it is uh, uh, actually designated as a proposed monument or a monument, well then of course you get the protection that comes with that particular status that would come through. If not, then we need the, the salvage laws of Hong Kong would apply. And of course that's the, the salvage laws from the International Convention of Salvage in 1989. Uh, and again, um, sort of the old principles of the law of salvage really being incorporated into there. Uh, one of the things that, that Paul's Bris, laws of Hong Kong uh, says, and the, the salvage ordinance isn't clear on this, is if you've got a band of wreck, then probably that would vest in the Hong Kong government. And that's probably a legacy of the, of the Crown prerogative to do with wreck as well. Um, the revisions of the uh, one thing that was specified when Hong Kong adopted this particular uh, um, international convention and incorporated into its ordinance was that it reserved the right that the, any property involved is a maritime cultural property of prehistoric or archaeological or historic interest situated in the seabed, then the law wouldn't apply. So we'd probably go back then again to the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance. Um, there is also an exception to state-owned vessels, uh, and that could be uh, important when you consider things like uh, the lump of metal that was found in the harbour near to Wan Chai as well, because it could be that that is uh, the remains of HMS Tamar, and then that could be a state-owned vessel, but of course there will be the issues about whether that had actually been sold off or whether the salvers who had purchased the wreck at the time had actually fulfilled their side of the bargain, and perhaps ownership had reverted back to uh, uh, the British. Problems for Hong Kong then. Big problems for Hong Kong come with our development uh, and the, the fact that we have, of course, reclaimed so much land for the sea. Uh, and we can see that if you just go across to Exchange Square over there. If you go over to Exchange Square, if you go up on the escalators, you'll see this cannon sitting there. And on it, it has a nice little sort of plaque which explains to you this was found in 1882 on the Exchange Square site during excavation. Uh, of course, that was already reclaimed land. So the fact that this was actually found there no one really knows where this cannon came from because, of course, the land, you know, the soil that had been put in there, the cannon could have been in there anyway. So that's one of the big problems for archaeologists in Hong Kong. We don't know what's been covered over, and of course, even if you find something in these areas, you don't know if it's been moved there as well. Um, protecting it, then, the big, uh, the plus side for Hong Kong is that we have got the Environmental Impact Assessment Ordinance, which contains heritage impact assessments. And these should protect our underwater cultural heritage. Um, as of 2007, uh, because of issues that have arisen to do with something else to do with our, well, our maritime heritage, to do with the 
the Queen's Pier and of course the uh, Star Ferry uh, Pier as well. Um, the public reaction to that was such that the chief executive at the time announced certain things to protect heritage. And one of those that was that any capital works undertaken in Hong Kong in the future, there would have to be uh, a heritage impact assessment. And those have been carried out and uh, I'm sure they've been carried out very diligently. Um, however, we still have problems um, as we come to in the next couple of minutes, hopefully. Notable discoveries in Hong Kong, we have got a Ming Dynasty shipwreck, uh, but it is actually under the waters of the High Island Reservoir. So this was found during the construction, and of course, various issues at the time about delaying projects which have come up with other archeological discoveries as well. Uh, so it was decided to cover it over, and apparently it's still there under the High Island Reservoir. More recently, Hong Kong's Underwater Cultural Heritage Group, and we've got some representatives here today of that group, um, discovered some interesting things. Um, they had some funds, they did some limited surveys uh, of certain sites around Hong Kong. They found some cannon, they found this uh, uh, anchor stock as well, uh, which I believe are being treated at the moment at the Maritime Museum, and hopefully will be soon on view there. I think the anchor stock at one point was on view there anyway. So again, there are things to be found in the waters of Hong Kong. And of course, the other issues are this wreck, which may or may not be Tamar, which is being looked at at prison. Um, how should the law in Hong Kong work? Well, if anything is found within these waters, and these are the territorial waters, I tried to put together a slide, as I said earlier, of how it would work. <laughs> I'm rapidly running out of time, so I don't even know if I can explain it to you. If anyone wants to listen afterwards, I'll try to explain it to you. You should start at the top left, and then sort of go around in a clockwork direction. The blue arrows are yes, the red arrows are no. I think that's the way it's going to work. But anyway, if anyone wants to, the slides afterwards, I'm happy to share them with anyone. The law in China, again, very quickly, because at the time, after those issues with the Hatcher Rex in 85, we get the 89 regulations concerning the management and protection of underwater cultural relics. The most important term, Article 2, which specifies, again, sort of maritime zones, uh, and what is designated as uh, relics. In the first zone, all cultural relics of Chinese origin or of unidentified origin or of foreign origin that remain in the Chinese inland waters and territorial waters are considered to be underwater cultural re relics. Article three will say, just to skip on, they're vested in the state. So it doesn't matter if this is a ship from a different jurisdiction or anything else, if it's in Hong Kong, inland waters or territorial waters, it belongs to the state. Second one, cultural relics, relics that are of Chinese origin or of unidentified origin that remain in seas outside the Chinese territorial waters but under Chinese jurisdiction according to Chinese law. That takes us further out. That's your exclusive economic zone. That's the, um, uh, the continental shelf as well. Uh, they would belong to China, but that doesn't include, of course, wrecks of foreign origin. So that's been left out there. And the final one, Cultural relics of Chinese origin that remain in sea areas outside the territorial waters of any country but under the jurisdiction of a certain country or in the high seas. Um, so this is outside of states' territorial waters, outside perhaps of their contiguous zone, but anything else, if it's of Chinese origin, the state, um, as we'll see in Article 3, has the right to identify the owners of the objects. So um, the laws in China are pretty strict. They say everything in Chinese waters in any way in Chinese waters uh, belongs to China within their territorial waters in the contiguous zone, that would include ships of foreign origin as well, even if they're identified as being perhaps foreign state ships as well. Um, outside of that, um, it's just the Chinese ships and that's uh, reinforced in the 1982 uh, laws on cultural rates as well. Uh, again, that's the just a clarification on these slides there. Um, the, the interesting one is this idea about the high seas and about ships uh, at seas under the jurisdiction of other states but not their territorial waters. It seems that the, the Chinese state in this law reserved the right to identify the owners of the uh, objects. Xiao has said, well actually, you know, this isn't, China may be trying to claim it, but of course this would be uh, questionable because these are actually uh, under the jurisdiction of other states. Um, and something else that's sort of inconsistent with the, the general principles of uh, law to do with wrecks in, in open seas and everything else is this. There is an obligation in Article 6 of the law, any unit or individual discovers by any means underwater cultural relics uh, coming in, that sort of definition in, in Article 2, subsection 3, 
um, has a duty to hand them over to the state administration of cultural heritage or to the administrative departments of cultural heritage in the localities to be identified and assessed. And that would be for the purposes, it seems, of the state actually deciding on ownership. Uh, and again, that's been commented on about this foreign territorial sea. Xiao says, uh, China doesn't assert ownership of, of any wrecks in foreign territorial seas, but that's because it asserts ownership of all wrecks of any jurisdiction uh, of any state in its own territorial seas. Um, China's policy, they've been spending an awful lot of money on underwater cultural heritage. It seems that with those sort of disappointments in the 1980s, um, China and part of its general like, uh, concept of the fact that cultural heritage is very important, um, started to spend a lot of money on underwater cultural heritage. Um, big projects, and of course, some of the most important, well, things like the Nanhai uh, shipwreck and the museum there. Um, a huge project. Think of the Mary Rose of building a skeleton over uh, the, the, the wreck and lifting it out. Well, here, the Chinese just went down and cut into the seabed and cut under it and lifted the seabed out to actually undertake the archaeology afterwards. Um, if we see a picture of the uh, of the museum, this is an artist's representation, that was then sort of rails were built to actually bring the wreck in there and uh, the archaeological investigation carries on as well. So huge amounts of money being spent, um, many different reasons, uh, possibly to encourage internal tourism, you know, the value of heritage. Politically, very important. We can see that with, um, uh, uh, you know, identification of certain now Chinese heroes uh, to do with um, uh, exploration. Um, again, that sort of concept that China's always been a closed state. There were the famous uh, um, Ming voyages of Zheng He, uh, and something that, again, China's been playing up in recent years, because, of course, you can see that these voyages that are meant to have gone on down into the coast of Africa support a narrative that China has been for a long time dealing with many of these states and that its present deals and uh, involvement in different states around the world are not a colonial exploitation as we have with the European powers and everything else, but part of China's peaceful rise. It's that whole narrative of China's peaceful rise and China's gentle rise. Um, recent issues, I mentioned the Black Swan project. Uh, there again is some picture of the, of the coins. Um, 2007, um, Odyssey Marine Exploration, a private company um, which, which goes really wreck hunting um, with some very uh, uh, well qualified archaeologists working with them and others, um, but it's a, a private company doing this, um, finds 17 tons of silver, mostly silver, but some gold coins from Gibraltar to the United States, an undisclosed location. Shortly afterwards, um, they go to court to claim arrest of cargo. Uh, the valuation of the cargo is uh, 500 million US dollars. And of course, at this point, questions are asked, particularly by Spain, because Spain says, where did you get those coins? You know, what type of coins are they? And of course, Odyssey refused to answer, give any, any indication of where the coins are from, what sort of coins they are, what date they are, anything else which of course arouses even more suspicions about where they come from. Eventually, of course, the Spanish government takes action in the US courts. The US courts demand more in, uh, information and eventually it's concluded that these have actually come from a Spanish ship uh, that was set off the coast of Portugal uh, in 1804 by the British. It's often the British that sent these ships. Right? But, uh, um, and uh, of course, we now get an issue over ownership of the cargo. Eventually, the American courts order Odyssey to return the coins, which is a very important decision again. If we think back to those ones from the 80s, um, we're, we're, we're much more into this issue of some of those wrecks from the 80s, they would have been Spanish ships, they would have been maybe more within American waters that things were going on. But again, we get this idea that perhaps things are changing even within the American courts with regard to this. Uh, in our area, um, the Tang wreck. Uh, it's probably one of the most important in recent years, and many people would have seen this in Singapore, or perhaps even when it's been on tour. Uh, I believe at one point there was a plan to bring it to the Maritime Museum, but I think the Maritime Museum decided that there were too many issues uh, with bringing this particular wreck. So it's a wreck that was discovered in Indonesia uh, back in the, the late 90s. Some fishermen discovered it, and of course the first the authorities know is that people are finding bits of porcelain being sold off. 
and the Indonesian authorities um, haven't got the resources to protect it. So they go into an arrangement with a, a New Zealand company um, to uh, recover uh, the wreck and, and on a profit sharing basis, of whatever can be recovered. Um, they recover about 60,000 items and um, uh, incredible items that sort of come from many different jurisdictions and evidence of trade between Arabia, Africa, and this area as well, China and this uh, uh, and the, the Southeast Asia uh, area as well. Um, it, unusually, this this cargo was sold as a whole. It was sold for 32 million US dollars, and it was purchased by a private company set up as a subsidiary of the Singapore government. So the Singapore government now have this uh, on a display in the uh, um, Asia Civilizations Museum, but there's also a touring ex uh, exhibition as well. Shows you the importance of heritage. The Singapore government said, that's great, we'll buy that. Uh, we'll use it for many different reasons. One of them being financial as well. We're gonna return on this. We've got a heritage industry. So they actually purchased this for their industry. Uh, lots of people weren't happy with this. Lots of archeologists got very unhappy about this, again, because of this idea of the exploitation whether there was proper recording, proper archaeological practices as well. So we had things like at one point it was meant to be the, a loan of the exhibition was, uh, was going to be exhibited in, in New York. And then there was a controversy about whether this should go ahead as well. Uh, one of the points that's been made by the, the company that actually recovered it is uh, in their justification, they said, look, there would be no cargo unless we recovered this. Because otherwise, you know, the fishermen, others would have carried on. Uh, the Indonesians couldn't protect it. Uh, so it's better for us to save it. Um, and there's some more information on it there. Um, other issues to do with wrecks? Well, the, you know, in recent years, we've seen a number of these headlines to do with this. Again, Indonesia, mostly. These World War II wrecks. Um, the, the issue is, you know, these are huge lumps of metal and uh, steel and other metals have been going up in prices. And it seems that people have just been going along and dragging them up. And if you follow the stories, you'll see the, the horrific tales about you know, them being dragged up still with human remains in them at times and the human remains being sort of hastily uh, um, buried, if, if they are buried, uh, on the shoreline or whatever else. So some wrecks have, have been affected, some have completely disappeared as well. So um, issues to do with those. Um, other issues to do with wrecks have been this, those World War II wrecks. There are so many of them around this particular area, around the Pacific and, and Southeast Asia, um, where you know, they, they carry toxic cargoes, in particular, of course, oil. And because they're rusting down, they're starting to leak these cargoes out. If any of you have been to Pearl Harbor and you've seen the Arizona, you know, when you look out, you see those little bubbles of oil coming out. Well, there are lots of those oil tankers all over this region as well, and that's infecting the environment. So those are some of the issues. <laughs> Conclusions in the future. Well, there will, will be more wrecks found in this area, there will be more treasure ships found, there will be more disputes and lots of people will be worried about this. This slide is really an admission because these are wrecked porcelains and they're mine uh, and that's in my office and uh, I'm, I'm admitting that now but I, this is my caveat, okay, um, I inherited these and I keep on thinking should I give them to CUHK's art museum really, right, I don't know whether they should be in private ownership. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from the Maritime Museum here. The last time I went to the Maritime Museum shop, they were selling bits of this, which I think Bill Jeffrey is one of the archaeologists, very prominent in Hong Kong, is not too keen on the idea of this as well. You know, um, if you are looking to buy any of these things, I was in Bangkok recently, and they're in their weekend market, there's a little store there. You know, I hope that this is fake. Most of it, because if not, they found a wreck somewhere. Because this is a whole stall which has encrusted vases. I mean, I think they're, I was going to say they're too perfectly preserved, but when you see things that came off the Nanking cargo and others, they are in very, very good condition. So the gentleman wasn't very happy with me taking photos, so I had to go and hide around. <laughs> um, so, internationally, what's going to happen? There will be many more discoveries, there will be many more disputes. New law, or probably not. You know, international law develops slowly. Um, my colleagues who do international life have be very careful what I say. In my area in cultural heritage law, cultural heritage laws are mostly aspirations. They're not laws. Uh, and, and so I'm not sure that would really help as well. 2001 convention, there are lots of problems with the convention. Um, states that you might think would want to sign up, say China, is it going to sign up? Well, China wants to exploit its cultural heritage. And that seems to go against the whole point of the convention. 
Um, those issues with jurisdiction about where these wrecks are are also a problem as well. Uh, there was a meeting involving UNESCO uh, representatives with uh, people from China's uh, uh, maritime experts uh, back in May of last year, uh, but I think it was just a meeting where people said nice things or, or whatever else. I don't think anything moved forward. Um, you know, uh, some things have gone on around the world. There is this concept of you know the poacher term gamekeeper. That's what I like to think. I'm an antiques dealer and now teaches heritage law, so I, I feel that way. But um, if you think back to Mel Fisher, his son is meant to be working now on some sort of uh, uh, um, projects with archaeologists from the state as well. Um, the benefit would be, of course, that they've got the experience in, in raising wrecks. And if they can work with archaeologists, it would be good. But of course, a lot of people are quite suspicious of these sorts of concepts as well. Um, another thing would be this. Will there be more state-funded exploitation? You know, Singapore shows you the way of saying, well, we'll spend all that money. Why? Because we think it's we get a good return from it, not just financially, but, but in other ways as well, because again, it portrays part of a narrative that Singapore wants to tell. In Hong Kong, what have we got? Well, recently we had the uh, announcements to do with the Lantau development, and people got very concerned about what would happen. I'd hope that if we had the Lantau development, the fact that we have heritage impact assessments would mean that actually we get a good review of uh, the underwater environment around Lantau. And Lantau should be particularly rich because it's where we've already found many things as well. Um, and again, I have a lot of faith in the heritage impact assessments and the people who undertake them and the reports themselves. I'm a little bit more worried of the fact that the people who, condition, uh, who commission them, the government commissions them and then acts upon them. And that's a bit more of a problem because, um, well, let's think of things like the Sacred Hill site, the well that was found at Sacred Hill. Think of that sort of site there as well. MTR were told there was something that might be there Perhaps you should move your station somewhere else, and so MTR completely disregarded it. You know, if that's the sort of situation you've got, well, we've got, a, we've got a great system, but is it being followed? That's a big problem. I would recommend anyone who's thinking about the future, what should be done in the future, to actually go to the Maritime Museum website and look at the paper that was produced with Bill Jeffrey uh, about what should be done about underwater cultural heritage in Hong Kong. Uh, and this is their proposal. I think the first one is the best, phase one. A two-year territory-wide survey of Hong Kong's underwater cultural heritage. Um, just look at that bit at the bottom. The estimated budget, I, I just wondered if that was a typo. You know, three million Hong Kong dollars. You know, that's not even the cost of digging up a station at Hong Kong, is it really a platform or whatever else? So it, it, it would be a very good use of money, I think, in that way. Contrast that with Singapore spending all those millions of US dollars to purchase a wreck. Now we don't know if we're going to find something like that in Hong Kong's waters, but we will find something. There are interesting things there. In the, in the limited uh, survey that was done recently by the Underwater uh, Heritage Group in Hong Kong, you know, they found things there with nothing like that sort of budget. So if, if they could actually undertake that review, it was back in 2014, I think, that those figures were put in, so maybe it's changed now, but, but again, even if it's a few more million dollars, it doesn't seem like a bad idea. If we think what's gone on in recent years in Hong Kong, we had in 2008 a review of 1,400 buildings in Hong Kong, historic <coughs> buildings undertaken by the Antiquities Advisory Board to try and give guidance about protection for the future. We had um, a, a review undertaken by HKUST on intangible cultural heritage, uh, a, you know, a territory-wide survey again, and we've had celebration of that. So perhaps it's time to follow this sort of recommendation and do a review of underwater cultural heritage or the possibility of it in Hong Kong. Um, apart from that, sorry I've kept you so long, we're already over time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you.